Hello and welcome to the John Conn Report live stream edition. You see Bram Weinstein, the voice of the commanders there. Appreciate you tuning in. Apologize for being a couple minutes late, but a crazy day. So bear with us. But there's a lot to talk about tonight because Washington did fire offensive coordinator Scott Turner. So you can imagine what's going to eat up a lot of this show. Bram, were you surprised? Not really. I mean... You know, it's funny, like when stories come out about, you know, about the team that Ron Rivera doesn't agree with or doesn't like, he makes a bringing it up. And there was one from Sam Fortier over the weekend in the Washington Post that he didn't bring up. So uh, and that was the day before the Dallas game. Um, you know, we're around it a lot. And there's been a lot of questions about how the offense functioned this year. And frankly, statistically, they weren't very good. They didn't score enough points in a lot of, um, you know, critical situations like third down conversions and red zone conversions and efficiency, they were not very good. So I don't blame that all on Scott Turner, but like, I'm no, to answer your question. No, I'm not surprised. No. And and I'm not either because a lot of what was in that article. And I know like, you know, I know that was like a couple of people contributed that, but I know that that was um, something that you'd heard a lot throughout last week. And Nikki and I talked about this on the podcast on Sunday after the game, because you knew that this was a definite possibility. And you knew that there were concerns about the offense all year. Ron Rivera had sat in on more offensive meetings this year than he had the past two years because there was a concern about the direction of, and, and the inconsistency of the play calling. That's from players. Uh, so you heard a lot of grumbling, and you naturally hear that at the end of the year. You're going to hear, you're going to see some finger pointing or hear the finger pointing, but it's, it was a lot. And the more you talk to guys, like, there were some guys say, hey, if he if he changes this, if he changes that, then it could work. However, that's a lot to ask. And then the, the risk was if you do change that and it doesn't work, man, you're in trouble because now there's no yeah. confidence whatsoever. So I think that's a problem, too. So for all those reasons, I was not surprised. And, and so, you know, I mean, how much blame would you put here? here I'm going to ask you, how much blame would you put on Turner for for what went wrong? Oh, that's a hard one for me, you know, because of my position with the team, frankly. You know, sure, like that's, I, well, I can answer that's, that. That's a, that's a, why I would rather you answer that question okay, because that's true. You're right. I'm, I'm not into, I'm not, you know, like, listen, I'm not surprised this happened today for all the reasons you cited and for a lot of others we can discuss, but like to assess the literal blame of it. I mean, I think there, there's a lot here. Like the root cause I think of the offensive problems goes back to decisions about the offensive line, in my opinion. Sure. But that doesn't mean, you know, that like, um, that I, that I think like the offense didn't overcome it in ways that it probably should have. And so, you know, I'd rather hear what you have. Yeah. And, and I would say, listen, I've been around long enough and you've been around long enough to know it's usually never one person. Right. So I think, you know, I'm going to start there that it's, it's too hard to always just say, well, it's just this guy's fault. You change him and now everything's going to be fine. However, you know, and I do look at, you know, there's inconsistencies that quarterback, the inability to find one, they've had eight. In, in, uh, in Turner's three years, he had to call plays for eight quarterbacks. That's not good. The offensive line has been an issue. And I think, you know, that all adds up. So, you know, I remember even on here, you'd have people saying on, on you know, message boards or whatever on the on comments, like the, the, the quarterback stinks, the line stinks, fire the coordinator. Well, it's kind of hard for the coordinator to have success if you don't have the other two. However, the more, again, the more you talk to players, the more it became apparent that there was a lack of confidence in what Turner was selling to them. And I think when you're a play caller on either side of the ball, one of the things you have to do is to be able to sell what you're, what you're, what you want to do. So, and sometimes that's, you know, if you have a Kyle Shanahan in there, he's going, you're going to come out of there thinking whatever, you know, whatever happens in the game, you feel good going into it because of this plan that he laid out and, you know, Hey, you got this plan, and there's, you know, I'm telling you, this this play is going to work. I'm telling you, that's going to that's going to work, and it just leaves you feeling pretty good about the plan. I don't think that they are they really felt like that. There were definitely times, definitely times where there were good games called, and we we saw that. But I think a big thing, Bram, too, and you heard it during the press conference with Rivera and Mayhew today, which is the their desire to be a run heavy offense, and I do think there was a struggle at times for Turner to want to do a little bit more drop back, a little bit more vertical. And I think it got him in trouble. I think it got him in trouble in the Giants game, that sack fumble. I know that didn't sit well with, with some others there. 
you know, in, in certain plays like that where you have control of the game and now you're giving it back to another team or you're putting yourself behind because of it. So I think there's, there was definitely a, a con- conflict of philosophy at times and the direction to take it. So, well, I mean, from that stamp, from that standpoint, like, so that's where you lay the blame on the play caller, but is everything his fault? Well, no, because the organization no. put a line out there that, to, that people know was subpar. Yes. And what's the quarterback solution. So that remains an issue too. Mm-hmm. And then, all right, think about this. Like I'm listening to them. I'm sure we're going to talk about their press conference today, which obviously happened before the news about Scott Turner. So they never addressed it. Um, but they, they come out and they, they say, you know, publicly, and we've said this to us a lot and and anyone who's paying close attention, will hear them say this a lot, but like they said it today that like, we want to be not just run forward, but run heavy, like two to one run heavy, like went on record and said that. And then think about the beginning of the, think about the beginning of the season where they were not doing that. And that's kind of not, in my opinion, what the Turner offense would be, you know, like not necessarily. So this isn't. It's an interesting mesh. And then secondarily, at the beginning of the year, they're throwing the ball a ton. And they're saying that it's because the rookie running back, you know, had an unfortunate incident, wasn't available to them. Um, and that that somehow changed everything on like how they would conduct their offense. I'm still kind of confused. If this is what you want to be, why didn't you just stay that way? Um, and so, and then there were multiple times during the season, Ron Rivera, you know, speaks through us to him. Like there were a couple times where, he said through us, you know, we need to run the ball more and be a play action offense. He wasn't talking to us. He was talking through us to him. Oh, absolutely. So, you know, so like, you know, like obviously like, you know, there, there clearly was not a great jibe between the its staff communicating what they wanted to do. And then we could have a different discussion about what they were really capable of doing, what they would have been best at doing. And I really do think ultimately the real downfall for him was they didn't score a lot of points. And I will go to the grave saying I will take this group of skill position people up against anybody on the whole of anybody in the league and their bottom third in scoring their bottom third in yards, their bottom third in red zone efficiency. They didn't score enough points. So isn't it the coach's job, even with vulnerabilities and deficiencies to figure out how to make do with what you have. And I never really saw that. I mean, I think it was at some point like late in the season where I'm like, I can't believe we haven't lucked into a 35 point game. Just like had one of those days, you know, like where we just lucked into something like that and it never really happened. And the one I think that really, for me was the most disappointing game. And I know a lot of people point to Cleveland. I point to the second giants game. That was the one that I left that going. I cannot believe we lost. I'm not really sure. I understand what the game plan was. And that was really disappointing to me. I, I think that was a, that was certainly a, um, that was certainly a, a bad look, and I think it made a huge difference. I think the first Giants game, too, that the drop back um, early in the second – was it the second second half, the sack fumble for a touchdown? That's something that I think was a big deal. By the way, Pac-Man D3 asked, do you think they promote Zamp, meaning quarterback's coach Ken Zampezi? Well, I think if there's an in-house candidate, he's the guy because it would, could keep, if – if they want to keep the system the same, I do think they want to keep the system the same if possible. So that way you lessen the change. So keep in mind, they're going into a fourth year with Rivera. You don't want a lot of change and have to have the offense have to learn a whole new offense. And so the way you do that, if you do want to keep that, then you promote in-house. And if you promote in-house, yeah, Zampezi would be certainly have a, a, um, a, a certain, a strong chance. Now they will interview outside candidates. I actually had people contact me saying, do you know what they're going to do? So there are coaches out there. that are definitely interested. And one guy was like, his client really wanted it because of Brian Robinson really likes him. So, you know, I do think that there is a, a, um, uh, uh, you know, but yeah, but anyways, to your point, to your question. Yes. I think that's a possibility. I don't know. I mean, they haven't started the process, but again, if you keep in the, if you want the same system, you're going to stay in house. It'd be Zampi. Yeah. Well, the, I mean, they've made it clear that whoever comes in here is going to run the offense they want. So I look at the, you know, I, I, I have no beat on who they're looking at, but like Tennessee just, you know, got rid of a number of staff members. Um, they run a run first play action offense. Um, the Whatever's going on in Los Angeles right now with Sean McVay makes me wonder what's going to happen with the staff because he clearly is toggling back and forth about coming back. And 
you know, here's the one who's got the most modern tree that people really, really like. And so I would look at some assistants out there and see what they're thinking while that kind of shakes itself out. Um, and then, you know, I mean, I mean, honestly, like, I'm not sure where else outside of the organization you would go. And honestly, like Rod Rivera, you know, is, is very into circle of trust, honestly. So is there somebody we're not thinking of that he's worked with in the past that is available that could be someone they bring in because he's very, very, very invested in people he's worked with and trusts and is loyal to. So I, you know, I just don't know where it's going to go. Honestly, at this point, I think it's too early for me to guess, but it's all the moves with Tennessee. And I'm kind of like, you know, what they talked about in that press conference today is exactly what Tennessee did. So, right. you know, maybe, maybe there's something there. And that Jay Kurt 20, his comment, not a question, his comment is no more veteran QB retread. What's wrong with going with a young guy, setting him up for success? Don't trust the staff to evaluate quarterbacks. Well, they've had eight in three years, so they have to prove it right. Um, so, but to, to his point, I think that is an option, but I think you've got to run through the process first. And I know that word process is going to scare people, but I do think you have to go through the process first. Who's going to be available? What if you can get a guy that's like, oh, that guy's really good. Now I know that's what led him to Carson Wentz last year, but I do think an option would be, you know, do you bring back Heineke? Do you go with Howell? Um, I think one game is, is a bit difficult to make that jump. Um, however, I think you have to look at all options. And you could could you upgrade over Heineke and bring in, a, again, I always throw out the name Jacoby Brissett. That's going to be my name for the offseason for no particular reason. Um, I did have someone a couple of years ago tell me that he would have fit this system, but it's more so like that style of veteran if you don't keep a Heineke can you go with that guy? And like, and if, and if Howell's not ready, then you roll with that guy. So that's an option as well. But I do, I think it's a bit early to say exactly what they're going to do because they just started the process. Um, so I think that's, that's the hard part. And I'm going to say this, I'm showing this because for the same reason, John Booth says it's super early, but which prospects stand out to you as options at pick 16? Well, it's too early for, to go there. I think what I would say, Bram, is not so much what which prospect it's impossible. We don't even know who's coming out yet, but what position? And so, like to me, the based on what they were talking about, and even Mark Mayhew in the press conference expressed a desire for young offensive linemen. I know you probably were applauding at that, but I think that's where you, I'd look at position. So if I'm looking at the draft right now, I'm looking at offensive tackle, and I'm pushing Cosme inside, and then I'm going to take another lineman later. What about you, Brandon? I'm not picking a quarterback in the first round. No, That's, not, 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 <clears throat> not under the circumstances. Be there no. At 16. Yeah. No, I mean, not under the circumstances. Um, you know, I, I, I wouldn't want that to happen. I, they have other needs. I think right now, if I had to guess, it'd be a tackle, you know, that's, that's yeah. I think it's a definitive need. And, you know, that's a great spot to take a solid player tackle, um, you know, and they have other needs they need to deal with. And, you know, I mean, really the overarching question for all of this is, and they did not answer this today and maybe they can't, and I'll give them a pass on that because I know a lot of the things that were asked about today, I don't feel like we got a lot of information out of them, frankly, <laughs> you know, like it's an understatement. Um, but to me, like the first question of the off season is who exactly, um, it, what's your spending capacity? You know, right. who's going to authorize a big move? Um, who, you like, how does that work? So let's just say you do want to take a run at, let's just an example, Jimmy Garoppolo. Well, is someone authorizing a $30 million salary? Like, is that, or, or the whatever signing bonus it's going to take to get a multi-year deal to get him to come here? Um, or Derek Carr, who I don't think they're interested in, but he is available. And so are they in this conversation? Which means who's saying yes to them trading assets and giving him 50 million in a signing bonus and 150 million over a three, four year deal? Like, Who's saying yes to that? And I need to know that answer before we can even start this conversation sure. because there's part of me that goes, are we even part of these conversations for people like this? Or are we in limbo until ownership is settled? And, you know, w when they say we'll do business as usual, yeah, to fill out a roster with deals that fall under a salary cap that don't involve a lot of balloon payment money going out the door immediately. But on the bigger ticket items like Deron Payne's long-term deal, or a quarterback where if you're going to go outside the building and try to find somebody and it's not just a run of the mill, you know, kind of leftover um, veteran, well, someone's got to authorize you to do that. And I'm kind of in the midst of wait and see to hear, um, can they at this juncture? And if they can't, when will they be able to do something like that? 
Well, and that's why I put up, um, I'm going to put this back up there, but from Cal DC 49, when do we get more info on team ownership? And that obviously plays into Bram's thoughts right there. <clears throat> I think we're going to get something. I would say this, the, the earliest a guy, a new owner would be approved is at the end of March at the league meetings. It does feel like something will be come out before them, but we can't say for sure because in this process, you never know. But, you know, nothing would shock me about the speed of which that might take place. But until that does, then obviously the Snyders own the team. So on Monday, the Rivera will sit down with the Snyders, and that's when you're going to learn the budget. So you're going to learn some of those things at that time. I will say they did fire Turner, and they had – they, you know, they, they, the Snyders were aware of this move. So they, yep. they were, they didn't stop it. Um, and so I don't know what it's going to look like, Brent, but that is a, that's the number one question to ask is how, what can you do? Because, right. you know, we don't know. We just don't know, but we'll find out the budget meeting takes place on Monday. That's so that's yeah. when they'll have a better idea. To go back to your original point, which was, um, are you surprised by this? I am surprised today only because after they said we're going to meet with current ownership on Monday, I didn't expect them to do this until after Monday. But this was approved, which means, you know, Rod Rivera does have the authority to do these things. Um, again, like, I don't want to, you know, dismiss the amount of money Scott Turner makes. It's it's an amount of money and he had signed an extension. Left. Right. Two years left and it's an extension. But that's not what we're talking about here. Like, we're, we're talking about who authorizes the Duran Payne deal that's not just a franchise tag? Who authorizes the very large signing bonus for a quarterback? Like, I think we need to know that. And, you know, until that happens, it's hard for me to know what they're going to do. And there's a lot of scenarios that could play out. I mean, the reality is, like, they could try to re-sign Heineke, bring him back with Hal, have a very, very small cap exposure next year at the quarterback position, get through a bridge year that way, and have no excuse with the cap room they have not to fill a lot of necessary holes in free agency this year and in the draft. And I could, and when I listened to them today, it sounded as if they are rearing up to see what's really available for them on the open market, which means the 20 to 30 plus million dollar quarterback, if they can acquire him. And then they do, I don't think this is going to happen, but they do not have to make a decision on Carson Wentz until March. That needs to be understood here. He has a roster bonus that kicks in in the middle of March. The rest of all of his money is non-guaranteed. Um, and when they get to March, they have to make a decision about him because if they don't release him by March 17th, there is 9 million guaranteed. So that's not going to happen. But I do think that they can, and I don't know if a lot of people want to hear this, they can kind of hang on and see how the market shapes up for them internally, externally. And honestly, while again, I don't think that's going to happen. No, they did not so. close the door on him not coming back. And the idea of him being forced to take a restructured contract with a far lower salary is a, I would call it 10% scenario if other things don't manifest the way that they want. It's lower than 10%. I think it'll be I'm lower than 10%. Yeah, I'm I don't. And I. I think I don't think I it's going to happen, but I'm just telling you. No, like, yeah, I think it'll be. I think it will. Um, you know, if people who for the people who think like, why don't they just release them today? They don't have to. No, they don't have to. <laughs> they don't I have do to. Think, though, None of the money in his in his contract on these last two years is guaranteed, but it it becomes guaranteed. The roster bonus and a portion of that salary does in the middle of March. That's when they have to make a decision about him. Right now, I will say, like, I think it'll happen sooner, just because there's they know that he's not going to be here and um yeah i agree that's what i think but so you that, know what they just but i they, also think in fairness to him it'll give him a chance to find something else if he if he is indeed able to but you're right to your to your point you don't have to do anything until then no it doesn't do anything to you it doesn't affect and, you and also did you listen to martin mayhew today when he said we got him, he said the good, the bad, and the ugly, but we got him to play in the style of offense that philosophically we believe he would be good at. And then he pointed out that at the beginning of the season, we weren't philosophically playing that way, which would suggest to you that things weren't necessarily on the same page. And then by the time he came back, he had a clunker, obviously in the one start that he had. It felt like that they just kicked the door open just an iota to go, you know what, like, 
maybe he didn't get the the fairest of shakes. I know nobody in the fan base wants to hear that. Like I, no. I know that nobody wants to hear that, and I still think it is extraordinarily low percentage. But my ears perked up a little bit when I heard it. Were they saying that to try to explain, you know, the decision making to get him in the first place and try to, you know, kind of absolve themselves of what doesn't look like the best signing? Because they went into a, you know, a major, you know, that was a major decision with a lot of eggs in that basket and it obviously didn't work out. Or were they hinting that if we can't acquire the people that we're looking at and want to, because as we've learned the last couple of seasons, just because you want somebody doesn't mean you're going to get them. They tried to get Matthew Stafford. They tried to get Russell Wilson. They may try to get Derek Carr. It doesn't mean they're going to get them. It doesn't mean that's going to happen. So are they leaving a 1% chance open that they may come around to leveraging him into restructuring his contract and taking a massive pay cut to come back? I don't know. I don't, I don't think, think so, so, but I don't know. No, I don't. I would be shocked by that um, because there's there. Yeah, I would just say I'd be shocked by that. And I know somebody, Jason Jones said with no Scott Turner, what does that mean for Heineke since he's been tied at the hip with Scott? They would like Heineke back. There's no doubt. And I do think he is open to a return. I think the hard part, if you're Heineke, I would want to know what is my role? Am I coming here as a backup to, to how he I would actually be. think. I think he right. I think he'd be okay with that. To be honest, so do I? Yes, I, 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 you know, I I saw him in the locker room yesterday. I saw him the night before. I thought he his head was completely on straight about oh what the future loved- is. For him. He knows he has a place in the league. He does like being here, and he openly. And I thought he was telling the honest truth that if that's what ended up happening, he'd be fine with it. He he really likes him some ham some Sam Howell. So so yes, I think he'd be open to return. The question though is. If they came to him and said, you know, hey, want to sign you, but we're also going to pursue this other veteran or this rookie, then if I'm Heineken, I'm like, I'm going somewhere else because I want to be a backup. So I think that's the scenario where you wouldn't see him back. So I think it's going to depend on what do they decide, which direction they go. You know how you can fix that, though? You want to know how you can fix that? Money. Guarantee it. Right. Right. No, you're not talking about a ton of money here. We're like, okay, you're going to get, let's just put a number on it. Guess 5 million for a, you know, a backup deal, non-guaranteed. Then he, guess what? He goes into camp and the coaches take a look and they like somebody else more. And then all of a sudden, you know, gone. Well, if you guarantee it here and say, we need you for a year, we're going to guarantee the money. Well, you think he's not signing that? Of course he is. They always like the money, Bram. Yes, I do too. The money always talks. (laughs) <laughs> but I will say, though, you know, if you know you're going to get the same money somewhere else, then or if you do get the same money somewhere else and you have a and you're second in line there, that's where you're going to go, because that's you know, that gives you a chance. But if it's the same offense, you know, then then that also plays into it as well, because, you know, that he knows this offense. So I think that would be something to consider as well. Anything else jump out at you from the press conference today? Um, besides not really learning anything, I don't really think they said much. Um, <laughs> they did. That's putting it lightly. Uh, <laughs> I, I really didn't get a sense of, but you know, on the, there, there was part of me that was like, after hearing this today, I actually really do wish that he had the ownership meeting. Cause I thought they could have both been a little more forthcoming about what the plans are because until someone tells them, can I write a big check? for a quarterback if we can acquire one yes or no we could at least have that understanding whether that was even possible or like do we have to franchise Deron Payne because we're not authorized to give him the deal that we'd like to give him you know or can we go do that right now um and what how much money do we have to spend I mean we know what our cap room is how much money do we have to spend and let's just say we want to go top of the guard market or something like that and we want to go pay somebody can we go do it and I think part of me is kind of like I kind of wish this happen next week where we could ask those questions and they'd be forced to be a little bit more honest. Well, not honest. They'd be a little, they don't know what they don't know at this point. So I don't think that they were able to answer those questions. So that was hard. Everything else to me. Um, I didn't learn much, honestly, like, and <laughs> the only other thing I would say is this, I, I, I and I, I mean this so respectfully, like, <laughs> Ron has this thing in the off season with people that we all know that they like, that they'd like to retain that he tries to like downplay as if he's playing like poker. And he's like, I'm not even going to show you my whole cards on the whole camera. You know, like, <laughs> like, like but like, so, we know you want pain back. Of course you want cam curl back. I think it's okay to say you like these guys, 
And he finally admits like, well, you know, like, like we don't want them in negotiating. They know that you like them. <laughs> like it's okay to say that, you know? So, so I, there's a, there's a little backstory to that too, because years ago when he was in, in Philadelphia coaching with Andy Reed, there was, if you remember, they had, it was like Al Harris was a really good third corner for them. And the defensive coordinator said something along the lines of, we have three guys we consider starters out there. So Al Harris's agent gets a hold of that, goes to Andy Reid and says, well, when it's time for negotiations, well, I want him to be paid like a starter. He's like, well, he's not a starter. He goes, well, this is what your coordinator said. He's a starter. So the agent w- did go to use that. So that's like, that's, and, and, and Rivera was on that staff. So Andy Reid kind of chewed those guys, or not chewed them out, but like was, hey, don't say this stuff. The problem yeah. is that when you count, let me say this, Brem, when you couch it the way you do, it's a, hey, I'm going to, say, I'm not going to say anything because I don't want this guy to know how much we like him. You're kind of saying how much you like him by doing that. Yeah. On so, Cam Curl, because someone's asking, is he a free agent? He's not. Actually, he's no, under contract for one more year. It's about extension for him. Y- yes. But like, I think what we all, it's extension time for him. Um, and because he was seventh round pick, he's making no real money at all. Obviously, he deserves a bump in pay. And it's just time to, I think, get that. I, in my opinion, that's when you get out of the way. Like, why let that go through the year? He'll probably be angry. And if I was his agent, I would probably consider holding out. So, like, you know, I think like I think for him um, that they're going to have to deal with him now. And they, they'd be right to deal with him now and get ahead of that one. With Payne, obviously, we know what the situation is. He is going to be at the top of the defensive tackle market. So he's going to get a very large contract. And they're just going to have to decide how they handle that. And this is not unlike McLaurin or John Allen. They're just going to have to decide how to handle that. But I, I think, you know, push comes to shove. They'll tag him if they have to, because he's not going anywhere. No. Not this and, year. and I like with Deron paying too, that the first step is the budget. They want him back. It's why they didn't trade him. And, and it's why they, even though that he was quote unquote on the market in the off season, unless you're blown away, they weren't going to trade him. And, you know, I, I do believe they've communicated to his agent, like, of course you want him back, but they got to get the budget set first. That's the first step. And then you go from there. But I'd be, I'll be certainly be surprised if they don't open negotiations soon, but whether or not they get it done, I don't know when they'll get it done. If they yeah, do, I don't know but, I do, but I do think they're going to try very hard to keep them. And then before you get to your point, Bram, I just want to put up John too. He said, if they bring someone from the outside in terms of the OC, I assume they will still want to bring their own assistance in on offense. Yes, that's you clearly that would be a consideration for anybody who bring who if they hire from the outside that yeah, they would bring in their own guys. So right now all the offensive staff is there, but yep. that then it, everything will be determined by whoever comes in. Then yeah, I have no real I have no real guess of what they're gonna do there. I mean, I saw one report say they're gonna do it from the outside, but I I don't really know that. So I, I don't you know definitely there's a chance for the inside. They're gonna look at outside candidates, but there's an absolute chance that somebody inside gets promoted. Yeah, And that somebody would be Zampezi because he's got coordinator experience. The natural jump is from quarterbacks coach to coordinator. So if they mm-hmm. do it from the inside, it would be Zampezi. But they are definitely going to interview outside candidates. Then mm-hmm. Neil M. wants to know, has anyone ever gone from never coaching to OC? I like Paulson, but that is a huge jump. <laughs> We've had a lot so, of people uh, with Logan Paulson, our buddy. Yeah, in <laughs> fact, I'll have him on within the next couple of days so we can talk to him about that. However, Listen, I love hanging out I with him. Logan. He boy, he knows football, and I lo- like I get to be in the building when he does these film reviews, and they're awesome. And he really knows it, knows it. Um, I think the bigger question is: Has anyone asked him if he'd want to do something like that? Well, I'm going to ask him. I have him on in the next couple of days. But the problem is, like, it's such a it's it's not just about like, hey, somebody knows the offense. It's about coordinating the offense, and it's about yeah. setting a game plan. It's about a rhythm as a play caller. There's a reason why. Even like McVay, the first year as an offensive coordinator, is not calling plays. Same yeah. with Kevin O'Connell, was not calling plays right away. You have to get used to coordinating an offense before you start calling plays. But I'm sure Logan would love that, and I'll ask him. And since we're uh, since we're giving everybody kudos, look at this. <laughs> this guy tells me I do an awesome job calling the games. Thank you very much. It there is you my go. Well favorite job I have ever, ever, ever had by far. I am very emotional about it. And I hope to never stop doing it until I get old and forget what's going on on the field. <laughs> well, I'm getting to that. I'm getting close to that point, Bram. So <laughs> it's, it's been a long time. I think I, yeah, it's been a long, it's been a long run for me. And it's funny, Bram, because I tweeted the other yesterday that I have covered, I have now covered as many name changes as I have playoff wins 
and I've covered this team since 1994. <laughs> That's wow. an amazing staff. You know, I had a really, I, I don't want to, I don't want to, you know, belabor this, but we had, I had a really cool moment the other day. We had Frank Herzog in the booth with us. I mean, it was just so cool. I used to go to RFK as a kid and listen to Sonny Sam and Frank. And we, and so, and that's my childhood. And it's why I adore this team. And it was amazing. And he came up in the booth on Sonny's day and he stayed the entire third quarter and he got to do touchdown Washington commanders on the Sam Howe touchdown run. Oh, that's while cool. We were calling the play. It was so cool. Did you get chills? I got chills. It was amazing. It was a full circle moment for me. It's something I'll never forget. It was amazing to do it, to be part of it, to have him there. And um, it, I mean, I, I just, I'm just, I don't know. I just want to glow about it for a minute. Cause it really was, oh. it was one of the coolest things I've ever been a part of. I was so happy we were able to do it. And I, I could tell you like there professionally, there is nothing that means more to me than, than doing this job. And, um, and it's, it's been a, it's been a dream come true. And I hope that I get to do it for a long time. Cause I, I love it. I put everything into it and I love it. I can second that you put everything into that. And it's, and listen, that day was cool. Like having Sunny, my disappointment with Sunday is Sunday is I did not get a chance to see Sonny. Yeah. And I think cause he means a lot to a lot of people. And I had the privilege of being around him uh, when, when I first started and, you know, got to know him a little bit and talk to him a lot. And it's just like his knowledge and his willingness to share that knowledge was, was tremendous. And, and I, you know, I just, I always, I always go back to the, Heath and Gus days and how even that first camp, he'd be like, Gus is the better quarterback. And then within a couple of years, it was like, they have to start Trent Green. He's the best quarterback out there. And he yeah. was right on both counts. And, yeah. But I always just, I always just enjoyed talking to him about quarterbacks, quarterback play, just a nice, nice guy. And I even said this, I think on maybe last time or one of the podcasts last week, which was back in the day as when you're on the road, you'd go down to the, to the public relation officials room to pick up your credentials. So you're probably in the same hotel nowadays. They give it to you on like a Thursday or so. So yeah. a couple of us, Jim Ducebella and Paul Woody and I go down to the PR room. I think somebody else is down there. Rick Vaughn was the PR director. This is years and years and years ago, but we're in the room and it, because it's in Tampa, Billy Kilmer and, and Tommy McVean, I think it's McVean was a, an equipment manager way back in the early seventies. And was with those guys and we hung out with those guys still. But they came in, they told stories, Bram, for like a half hour, at least a half hour. Yeah. And and it was tremendous. And when they left, it's like, do we applaud? Because it was that entertaining. <laughs> but the yeah. funny thing is, like, McVeigh is telling these stories and, like, you'd see Billy Kilmer sitting there, like, smiling at the memory of, of his yeah. exploits. And Sonny was kind of, like, a little bit sh um, sheepish about it because, like, I think one enjoyed hearing it and one was like, yeah, that used to be me, but it was, it was awesome, but it was just so much fun to get to know him because he is a legend. And, you know, that, I think the whole day was cool because of that. Fun. I'm glad that a, you know, that everything turned out right. I'll just say that. On your point about, he said, play Trent Green. Who wanted us to play Heineke from the get go? Huh? I did. That's me. Oh, oh, with you. That's right. I, somebody on here is, I had a 50% chance of getting that right. Told you. <laughs> told yeah. all of you. I told all of you. I got By made way, fun of in the summer. Blah, blah, blah. This high to keep that. I'm like, that guy knows how to play. That's I love but, that. And, you know, know the play. funny thing is, it was during, the, I certainly believed that based on, you know, um, what they wanted to do with Wentz, the, the talent they had around him compared to what he had in Indy, that it would be okay for him here. And the play action and the deep ball, et cetera, I thought could work. And I did not, what I didn't take into account, one is that he was not even as mobile. And I think they failed in this too, was that his mobility was less than what they thought. And yeah. then, then you take a guy who has a pension for holding the ball and you put him in a new offense behind protection that isn't always great. Correct. And so like the combination of all that became an issue. And I do believe, like I know Rivera talks a lot about they had this plan for Brian Robinson. Well, I remember talking to people early in August about like what they thought of Brian Robinson or what the offense they thought could be. So it was similar division to what, what yeah. Rivera was talking now. But I think, but having said that, like Wentz never really grabbed hold of this offense as we saw. Yeah. So, you know, I, I think after a while, it was during the Bears game, I remember thinking like they're going to have to play Heineke. And this is before yeah. we knew he was hurt. 
but they're gonna have to play Heineke just because they need somebody who can move. Yeah. So. And it, it's funny too, like, um, in hearing Martin Mayhew, like kind of defend it, defend the move. Cause you know, they have to defend the move now. And I don't, I don't know that they can, but they're trying, you know, he did say he, he, he hearkened back to philosophically, this is what we're going to do. And this is why we actually thought he'd be a really good fit. And it's really funny. I mean, not that I'm a scout or anything, but I came to the same conclusion. We talked about this all summer. I said, you know what? Like in play action with ball fakes, quick decisions, get the ball out of his hands, run first offense. I actually think there's a possibility here with him where I don't like him is these slow developing plays, drop back passing. His decision-making is interesting. His accuracy is clearly off. And, you know, I, I just, he's not as mobile as he used to be. And I just feel like, you know, if they can get him in that style of offense, I see what they're saying. Then they didn't do that, you know, at the beginning of the season. And they paid a price for it, not only with him, but with protection issues and all of it. And some schematic issues, in my opinion, too. If you go back to that Eagles game, go watch that first Eagles game. They were running plays. Why would I want to do that? They were running intermediate pass plays that had no chance of being completed because they didn't have the time to do it. Right. That's on That's on everybody. And that's on Scott. You know, yeah. like that's on everybody. To, to that point, Bram, I was going to bring that up, that there were times where I even talked to a player about this on Friday, that there were times where you'd see a play like, I really like that play, but I don't think these guys can pull it off. Yes. Because I the execution, like there were a number of times like, yeah, Terry McLaurin is open here, but she's not going to, he's not going to have the time. Have time. And, and so like, there were a number of times where you said that, like there, were, you know, like this play works, but not with this group, you know, that screen, like the screen game never would never work. Because you don't have the guys that can block in space like that. Even though I look at the screen, I was like, holy crap, you blocked this. It's 45 yards. But they couldn't block it. That's so right. it was never – so it was fine. I, I still feel like, you know, not to, not to, you know, like the quarterback situation remained in flux. And that's of their own making. But I do think the root of the issues was the offensive line from the get-go. Yeah. You that was fix really that. the root. And that, and that is not Scott's fault. He no. didn't make the decisions that were made there. And didn't react to the things that were happening in real time, specifically in the preseason. So on that, I put up one of those questions. What do you think they're going to do about the offensive line? Because I clearly, it has to be addressed, you yes. know, and in multiple ways, I think. I personally think, I think tackle is logical for them at the top of the draft. If not in this, if not bare minimum second round. Yes. I think Sam Cosme may be a guard, but he, if you talked to him yesterday, he was surprised by all that movement around. So the, he needs to figure out what they're going to do with him. You know, is Chris Paul a starter? I don't know. You know, like they clearly have a problem at center because of injuries and they have to make some decisions about that. And Chase Rulier is scheduled to make a lot of money. So I think there's going to be some decisions on him and they're going to, have to make some decisions. So I don't know where you are, but it feels like that's going to be the A outside of quarterback, the A number one thing that yes. they have to deal with. And it's not a simple fix by getting one person. No, it's not. And uh, to your point, like with Cosme, for example, what he wants to know is what position am I playing? I don't care what it is. Tell me what it is and keep me there. No, no yo-yo stuff. So if you're going to put me a guard, fine, I'll go be a guard. And I know that they like him there because of his movement skills and all that. So I think that to me is one thing that that's what I'm, that's one of the priorities, like Sam, you're going to be a guard. Um, and then I'm drafting a tackle in the first round, if at all possible. I'm not going to force the pick because I think when you force a tackle or force a pick there, then you're making a mistake. But if you're there's a tackle that's near there, if you want to trade back a little bit, get some more assets, fine. But you need to address that as well. As far as center, with Ruye and Larson, I think if one of those guys is healthy, if they think one of the guys is going to be healthy – that's who they'll go with. If you you can't bring Ruya, I think it's like 12 9 or 12 something this year. The, I did bring the numbers. I don't have it in front of me. I did the numbers the other day, it's, but it's like too much. Yeah. It, you have and, to restructure honestly, that because two years in a row. And, and right. I, think, I think they're going to have to make a decision there. So they like Larson. They did well with Larson. We've seen the stats that they win a lot with Larson. Um, and then with Chris Paul, that's going to be interesting. Even regardless of what they think of him, I'm getting another young interior lineman in that draft. It doesn't have to be. You know, it could be two picks in the first four rounds, but I'm getting another guy in there because you need to build it up. They have the makings of a strong defensive line for years because of the tackle, what they've done, especially if they keep paying. I would attack the defensive depth in the set in the back seven in the, on defense, yep. but I would get I fix the line because I like the tight ends. 
And I'd like to see more involvement from the tight ends. That was one of the disappointments too in the red zone. But just overall, I didn't feel like they created enough mismatches with the talent they had at tight end. That's something you can do next year, but you've got to fix the line. I agree. And I think you have to bring, I think you need to have two. If you could bring two young guys on that line, suddenly it looks a little different because, um, because now you have young tackle, young guard. If Chris Paul, it's another, it's another young guard. All right. King Slim. King Slim 202. First of all, he liked Jacoby Brissett. So I like, so we'll go there. But he says tackle is a wasted pick at 16. Last year, we got a game changer at the same spot. Need one on defense now. Unless there's a really good lineman there, then it's a wasted pick. No, it's not a wasted pick because you no, need the guy no there. It's a wasted pick if you force it. If you, there's a guy that you, and I've seen it happen here. Um, there, if you have a guy that's rated in the bottom of the first round, and you pick him there, that's a wasted pick. It's bad value. Uh, the game changer on offense didn't change it. I love John Dotson, but I don't oh, know that he's a hit. You know, oh, he's, a, he's an absolute hit. He's an absolute hit. But my he's point like, is like, yeah, no, no, no. That's that's a fantastic pick. But I like, think back to draft night and the way people reacted, and then the first oh, few yeah. practices, I was like, oh my god, wait till you see this dude. <laughs> right? No, I I love watching him. the The question I have, and it's funny because I've heard this from some other teams, and this goes back to the roster construction of this offense, which is. You know, other teams knew they didn't have an offensive identity. Like they liked the receivers, but they didn't necessarily like a match with the offensive identity and philosophy. That said, you know, I'm not King Slim. I wouldn't force a tackle, but that's the first place I would look because yeah. they need a guy there. Like, yeah, I if think you so. have a good tackle there, like why wouldn't you take him? Now the defensive difference maker, they have like they're paying a lot of money for those guys up front. If those guys aren't making a difference, then you're paying them. Then you got to get them out of here, right? Yeah. But by King Slim, my second point would be the other position I would look at hard there is cornerback. Yes, corner is a necessity. Linebacker first, they need to make a decision about Cole Holcomb. Right. Either way, they need more depth there for sure. But we, what are we talking about? A starter? Or not are we at talking six, about not taking depth? one at sixteen. No, not at 16. Unless, I, I, yeah, unless Holcomb's gone and you say. Yeah, no, no. I, I didn't mean linebacker for the draft early. I think like clearly that's a pick early, a linebacker somewhere in the second, third round, fourth round, something like that. That's got to happen. And then we got to make a decision about Holcomb because if one viable linebacker on the roster right now, I mean, like they're going to have to do something here. My gut says they got to do something in free agency. I don't know about a huge deal for somebody, but they got to do something here. Get younger, get faster at that position to get behind them. O-line to me is the glaring need. I agree with you about corner. If for some reason there is a good playmaking corner, that's going to be hard to turn down, you know, especially at something like 16. That'll be hard to turn down. But tackle right now is the gut. But, I mean, it's January. Call me in three months and I'll tell you. Right, we don't know. And it it all depends on who, like, I say tackle right now because that's we know that they need to fix that line. But when you get to the draft, you say, you know what? Yeah, they need a tackle. But in that range, who there's is there anybody – I mean, I don't know this. This is general. Would there be anybody good? If there's not, you don't force it. And then yeah. you take best player. And if it's a corner, I say more power to you because I think they need that as well. A um, couple more here, Bram, and then we'll get out of here. I did want to point out something Jennifer Sheets um, had asked earlier. Uh, hire for, or Not even ask, but this is her opinion. Hire Frank Reich as OC, works well with QBs, knows how to use a good, good back, and Jonathan Taylor. All that is right. I think I would hire that guy in a second. I think he probably wants to be a head coach again. That's that would be my guess. Um, I I don't know that he would be a guy that you'd be able to hire for that reason. But he would be if you did. I think it'd be a fantastic hire. And then Brad G says another year, another needing a QB. LOL. In fairness, Brad, it's only been thirty some years, so you can't expect this to happen overnight, right, Bram? No, uh, apparently it won't. And uh, to whoever you know, whoever said the stuff about the Bears. If they want to trade Justin Fields, oh yeah, uh, call me interested on that one. Oh, you know who else would like him? These I'm interested guys. in that one. <laughs> they they liked him a lot before the draft, and they, yeah, they, they definitely consider. I like him a lot him. now. Let's go. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, but if you're the like if you're the Bears, I'm not. I'm not doing that. I'm no, keeping of course him. not. They're, they, that's that's brief. They, that's gamesmanship. They're not drafting a quarterback. They're the 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 uh, the draft's upside down. They don't need a quarterback. They're open for business. Call us. Yeah, they're gonna get three first round picks, move down three spots, and take best defensive player available anyway. Watch. That's what's gonna happen with them if they're smart. 
Yeah. And then last one here we'll go and then we'll get out of here. It's been a long night. Thank you guys for joining us. Um, but let's see, Mega412, why would we pick a QB in the first when we have other glaring needs on the team? LOL. Everybody likes to use LOL with their draft. I don't know why. Is that, is that some, but yes, I don't think you're going to pick a quarterback at 16 because I don't think the guy is going to be there. I think the top three quarterbacks will go Bryce Young and then whether it's CJ Stroud or Will Levis, the, whatever the order is, I think yeah. all three of those guys are gone before they, as of right now, the, my opinion would be they're all gone by then. In, in two months, who knows? And then you got the quarterback from Florida, Anthony Richardson, that people are saying could go in the first round. I just think that he'd be – I would take those other three guys. I think Richardson would be for, – for a coach going in this fourth year who has to win, that's, a, that's more of a project. I wish that he had shown more consistency at Florida. Um, but – so I don't – so I think to your point, Mega, I agree. I don't think you're going to go quarterback in the first round unless somebody just falls to you there. That's why we're looking at some other other stuff. What do you think, Bram? Yeah, I, I don't. I don't think quarterbacks the direction. Um, right. You know, unless for some reason one of those names that you named for some reason is dropping, and that would be a bad sign anyway. But like, if they were for some strange reason, then you know we'll talk about it. But I don't know. We're months away, and it's hard for me to know at this point. My gut says right now that a tackle or a corner is the most logical things for them to take in the first round. Right. And Devin, I lied. Last one. Devin Fitzpatrick says Thomas Brown from the Rams is a guy. If McVay retires, he'd be a, he'd be a guy that I think um, teams will be interested in at some point. So yes, I think if you're going to do that, like I, I, I could, I wouldn't be shocked if he gets a look because he's done a good job out there and it's the McVay tree. Uh, so we'll see, but I, you know, I don't know that he's on their initial list. I don't know. Yes or no, but I do think he's be a guy to watch for some team whether it's here or somewhere else. Anyway, Bram covered a lot. I appreciate you joining me as always and appreciate everybody else tuning in. I do want to get Logan Paulson on here to talk about all this stuff in the next couple of days. So I'm going to put a little pressure on him. Not really, because we've already talked about it. So anyways, join me again. I'll be back. I think it'll be Thursday or so. So I tune in then and I'll talk to you next time.